and welcome um, to Tony's Climate Action Week 2024 um, and to this session on measuring your climate impact in international education. Um, it's great to see you all. If you are able to, and if you would like to, please turn your camera on, um, drop a note in the chat to introduce yourself, say who you are and where you are, where you're from. Um, we've got a nice group here. Um, I'm doing a bit of multitasking and admitting people in from the waiting room as well as running the PowerPoint. Um, so bear with me as we go, but lovely to see you all. Um, I am just going to kick off. Um, we may have a few more people join us on the way, but hopefully you can see these slides. Um, as I mentioned, this is day two of Climate Action Week. Um, we, I'm delighted to be joined by Emily O'Callaghan and um, CJ Tremblay. Emily is from um, the International Education Sustainability Group, and CJ is um, known to many, um, and known to Canny, um, and is the founder and managing director of Alethea Global Cooperative. Um, my name is Debs McAllister. I am not, as was advertised, Paul Loftus. Unfortunately, he was unable to, to join us today. So I'm stepping in and um, it's just great to have you here. I am on the Canny Global Board and I'm currently Vice President on the Global Board. And prior, well, alongside that, my day job is working for U21, University of 21, um, as Project Manager. So just to kick off and introduce uh, CANI, if you don't know uh, the Climate Action Network for International Educators, um, CANI was founded late 2019, and we're really fortunate to have some of those founders with us today on the call. So thank you um, for what you've done and where you've brought us to. It means, it means a lot. We are a volunteer-run organisation. Um, as I mentioned, I'm on the global board. We have a number of people on the global board. Um, we have three regional chapters, a number of working groups that, that, that really um, focus on us achieving our mission and our vision, which is for a reimagined international education sector that reaches net zero emissions by 2030. We are ambitious. Um, we like to um, put ourselves up for awards and we're really grateful that, you know, we are being recognized by the international education sector and industry through um, being a finalist at the Pioneers um, and the other awards that have been noted there. Um, CANI spans, as I mentioned, the globe. Uh, we have practitioners from over 750 institutions around the world. Um, and we have a number of uh, organizations that have become CANI Accord signatories. Um, what is that, I hear you ask? Well, you'll find out a little bit more as we move on through this session. Um, <laughs> also, just to mention that we are a um, volunteer run organisation and we really welcome support, new people, people with energy enthusiasm, people that aren't sure where to start with their climate action journey, please get in contact, reach out, join Canny. Um, you'll find it's a wonderful network of people um, and organisations, good people doing good things. So. A huge thank you to the University of Tasmania, one of our sponsors for this um, Action Week 2024. University of Tasmania was the first university in Australia, and I think it remains the only university in Australia, to have signed the Canny Accord, more on that later. Um, and just to introduce you, Taz, to you, I have a quick video. How do I feel about the sustainability agenda? Passionate but impatient. As fast as we go, we've always got to be going faster. My colleagues are doing remarkable things, but every time we do a remarkable thing, I know we've got to do more because we have to solve this now. The University of Tasmania has a very clear, holistic sustainability agenda. We have embedded it into our overall strategic plan for the university. It has its own framework for sustainability that encompasses four main areas of activity that are to be taken into account in all of our decision-making and activities. The projects we choose always deliver additional environmental and social co-benefits, for example, biodiversity protection, or the creation of jobs for local communities. Oh, 
while we do multitasking is not my forte at this time of night. Um, let me get us back to our slides. I cannot. Okay, excuse me. We'll go for this. And we'll run straight through it again. Um, no, thanks to University of Tasmania. Um, and also a huge thanks to Aletheia Global Cooperative, um, who are also our sponsor of this year's Climate Action Week. Um, Aletheia Global is a worker cooperative and a sustainability training consultancy. Now, I won't say too much about that because we do have the wonderful CJ Tremblay from Aletheia Global here with us today, and she's going to be talking about their work and what they do. So just to let you know our overview, I'm going to hand over to Emily uh, to give us some insights around um, IESG and what they do, and then on to CJ, um, and then I'll come back and talk a little bit more about uh, the Canny Accord, um, and we'll have some time for questions. So please, as the presenters are speaking, feel free to pop your questions in the chat, and we'll do our best to answer those um, at the end of each uh, session of presenters. I'm going to stop sharing. Over to you, Emily. Thank you. Hopefully this works. Oh, wrong one. Sorry. <laughs> uh, can we all see that? Excellent. Okay. Um, well, one, thank you for having me here today. And um, yeah, congratulations to Kenny and all the volunteers um, for a great uh, Climate Action Week. So I'm Emily O'Callaghan from Wurundjeri Land and um, coming to you today from the land of the Karagal people. And I pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, so before I get started, just a bit about the International Education Sustainability Group. So ultimately, IESG aims for an international education sector that thrives, um, but that is climate conscious. So um, we've been, we've worked out that the three of us, us three co-founders have been working in international education for about six decades. Um, so we have a number of colleagues um, who we, yeah, are just um, wanting to ensure that I guess the activities that they do um, are considerate of, of climate and the work that, that we do um, as much as international education is a force for good, you know, it does, does come with the climate cost so that they actually understand that and mitigate that. Um, so you'll know um, my colleague, Elsa Lemont, who is on the call today, and many of you will know her as co-founder of um, Canny. Um, there's also Will Archer, um, our third co-founder, who um, founded the International um, Student Barometer. So uh, the ISB, um, which many of you would know, um, tracking, I guess, student student sentiments. So bringing those, those skills together um, and then working with our colleagues, um, both in the UK and, and here. Um, we have a, a great core team and we also had um, an advisory team um, have an advisory team who um, oversees the, the work of the Climate Action um, Barometer as well. And we've got um, Adrian on the call today, um, which is great. Um, so hi, Adrian. Um, and I, I think um, in, in saying that as well, a lot of um, the work that we do, and um, it, it looks at initiatives um, and actions, you know, practices and policies that, you know, relate to obviously climate um, and some of that obviously relates also back into the Kenny Accord so there's some really nice synergies um, there which you, you'll see as I, I present um, through this today. Um, so what is the climate action barometer? Um, so it's a it's a rolling benchmark um, that tracks um, policies um, and practices across time and um, we have a, a context setting to that which is called the climate eye and that ultimately looks at an institution's emissions so they can one understand um, you know what their impact is um, across different different teams and different areas of international operations, and then obviously consider that and consider different ways to not just mitigate that, but also um, thinking about other ways to engage um, people within their institution, their students, and also their their partners um, in climate. So as I said, it's it's looking at those different policies and practices, measuring the footprint, um, and then looking at ways to reduce that and educating those partners and peers, um, and then setting those roadmaps and, and a target for for future. So the idea that it's um, it, is that it's done year on year, so you can actually kind of look back um, at yourselves and your own institution, um, and think about how you can um, you know, make make a difference within um, your decision making that 
um, you do a crushing institution. So this is a scope and structure of, of what is measured. Um, so staff engagement, student sentiment engagement, and then, as I said, across those different teams of international, so marketing and recruitment, learning abroad, teeny and global campuses. And we look at the, the emissions um, via that climate eye, um, and then also your, your sectoral engagement and collaboration, so how, how you're working with others and, and your various networks um, to also implement change. So we recently just completed um, a pilot and big thank you to the founders group. It's great to see you, Taz, um, sponsoring Canny today. And nice to see Carmen um, on that video as well. So Carmen's on the advisory board too. And obviously each of these pilot institutions were integral to kind of feeding back into that continuous improvement of the study itself as well. Um, so a bit about, I guess, why um, those institutions joined. There were different um, people within the institution um, or different positions um, that joined for different um, reasons as, as well. Um, Alistair and I kind of joke that it doesn't really matter why why people join or who decides to join, just as long as they do so that they can, you know, start actually kind of considering their impact and making, and making those changes. Um, but we're also really excited, um, I guess, to hear from these institutions. We just finished our reporting back and um, had a session at API recently. And it was great that Western Sydney University and also University of Auckland, who were um, on that session, hum humbling even, I think, to, um, to hear that they were already implementing some of the rec recommendations as part of the report. Um, so this is the, the pilot wave. So um, nine institutions, so eight universities um, and, and Navitas. Um, 100 plus international student enrollments, so obviously a large impact just within that own group in terms of emissions, those 254k emissions, um, and 22% of, of their enrollments were, were international, so you know, a fifth of their students were international students. So the headline findings, um, which I think we kind of already hypothesised in a sense, was you know that as, as much as institutions all have sustainability teams and um, usually sustainability strategy in place um, and it's core to the university it's not necessarily core to international so um, this is the institutional level and, and the results from the pilot and institutional level so each of them you know, had um, policies in place for emissions reductions plans they all had commitments to sustainability and commitment to climate action um, and then the importance of actually in the institutional strategy was also quite high as well. So you can see those little dots at each of the pilot institutions being benchmarked against each other. And then this is the international. So again, so sustainability strategy, none of the institutions um, had any type of sustainability strategy within um, the international plan. Emissions and reductions for international operations, only, only one. Um, and then climate action as a responsibility with international. They, they deemed that it was you know not not necessarily their their responsibility um so it was kind of pushed on to I guess the sustainability team and I think one of the great organic outcomes from this as well um, which was, was has been shared by um most of the teams that it was led by internationally is that they it actually gave them this kind of lever to talk to the sustainability team and actually hear about all the different um, things that they were doing for the institution. So this is a bit about climate eye. So as I said, for that context setting and understanding what their emissions are. Um, and as I said, you know, what if you if what what we measure actually gets done. So it actually makes people kind of consider um, things, you know, seeing seeing the numbers and seeing um where things are at. You can look at it year on year and actually think about you know what you're doing across those different teams to to mitigate some of that travel as well. Um, but ultimately the methodology um, has assumptions specific to international. Um, so we created it um, with different guidelines, um, but created and particularly for the pilot in terms of those assumptions, it was air travel only because it was Australia and New Zealand. And now we're reaching out to a global wave. So it's actually looking at assumptions around um, train um, at travel and then getting into some more granular detail, particularly if institutions actually track, you know, how their staff or students are traveling as well. So this is the results um, from the pilot um, wave. So as you can see, the, the main impact, I guess, is coming from those international student enrolments coming in. Um, transnational education, we found, had less of an impact just because a lot of the transnational um, education students were obviously studying in, in country um, and all, all coming from countries, neighbouring countries that were quite close by. Um, outbound student travel and obviously inbound um, student travel was 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 less just because the less less student numbers as well. 
Um, but interestingly, staff travel made up a very small um, proportion of that. And that um, is specific to international operations, so staff within international operations. So a bit just about how we report, just so you can kind of get an idea of that. So as I said, we're reporting across those different categories and, and we're benchmarking it so institutions can actually see you know, how they compare across time. This was this institution was great, as you can see, <laughs> um, um, or above above the average in, in each of the, the categories. So, but still a, a way to go. And again, we we kind of hypothesize this as well in the sense that it is it is new to international, you know, international aren't necessarily um, weren't necessarily thinking about this you know a few years ago um, particularly when Elsa started her her work you know se seven years ago and kind of started getting people thinking about this and um and you know Kenny obviously we we understand the the importance of this but getting you know your, your international colleagues on on side as well and understanding it it's it's um it's not something that may be one of their priorities so we we weren't expecting um you know, high high results in in a sense because there are a lot of the initiatives and activities um, are kind of new um, for the for the people working in these areas. Um, but as you can see, so there's a, there's a way to go, um, not just um, for the group, but for also this um, institution that was as yeah the the, the best in in a sense of, of of the group. And then this is just another example of how how we measure as well. So this is in in terms of across the whole pilot. So we. Um, we look at across the question questionnaire set that we're asking and the policies and practices that are in place, and then we actually um, benchmark them. We, we weight them and we actually average them out and, and benchmark them in a way that you can actually see where, where you sit amongst amongst your peers um, as well. And again, as you can see, there's a lot uh, a lot more work to to be done um, in general across not just the pilot group, but I'm sure others as well. So next steps for uh, the for climate action barometer in, in general. Um, so obviously now um, we're excited to be launching the, the global wave. Um, we've got a, a few institutions that have, have joined that wave um, and we're excited to um, be kind of starting that um, data collection all the way across April um, through to July. Um, that will also include a number of those um, institutions from that first, part, first pilot wave as well. So. Um, half those institutions signed up for for three years, so it's great that they're also able to kind of benchmark themselves year on year. Um, but as I said, it's about that um, continuous cycle of improvement. So actually understanding where you are um, and where you stand now, um, thinking about um, the recommendations that we we give to institutions as as part of the reporting, and then using those to improve your policies and practices, and then measuring that again over time and against your peers as well. So. Yeah, exciting times um, for us and very busy times. And if you would like any more information, um, obviously reach out to Elsa or I. Um, you may have also been on the on the Kenny um, webinar where Elsa presented on it with a couple of our other institutions um, as well. But yeah, that's that's it from me. Over to CJ, Ashu. Thanks, Emily. Um, so yeah, I just want to pause briefly and see if there are any questions. <clears throat> on the uh, Climate Action Barometer from anyone here. Feel free to pop them in the chat or raise your hand, use the hand raise function or wave magically at me on the screen. Emily, I think I've got a question that I'd like to ask around, you know, the pilot group that you've just worked with um, and kind of feeding back their, their kind of benchmarks and, and what that looks like. Have you, what's the response to that been? And have you seen any um, of those institutions, um, you know, run with that or stall with that? Or, you know, how, how has that um, been managed in those institutions? Yeah, so across, um, I guess, each of those international operations um, categories, we also provide a list of recommendations that they can take going forward. And I think that's been, um, I guess, as I said, the most humbling thing has has been that even though we literally just finished reporting a few weeks ago, some of the institutions have already started implementing that. Some of them we still need to actually meet with and and talk through the the report. Um, but yeah, the the two that we actually did because we needed to because we were presenting at API um, to know that they were already implementing those um, was yeah just amazing and. Um, the, I guess the, the second component of it is also um, we're developing a best practice exchange. And so what that looks like is, I guess, across those different areas of international thinking about 
um, you know, who's who's doing amazing things promoting that, but also looking at where people have have gaps and kind of helping bring them along that that journey with with the other founders as well. And that will obviously also help inform um, the study again, because there may be um, initiatives and things that come up that we, that we think, okay, yeah, we should be asking whether institutions are also um, do, doing those um, different activities part of the process. But in general, it's, um, yeah, it's been, been quite humbling and um, we're kind of excited that as the reporting gets out to the different areas of international as well, I think there's um, particularly within institutions um, and you kind of see it across Canny, you know, some, some are from recruitment, some are from learning abroad. But if if you've got a passionate person who, you know, wants to take the lead on this and they've got something, you know, that they can measure, but also those recommendations, um, yeah, we think it just will, will give them their own agency to actually start, you know, delivering on some of that climate work. So. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to hand over to CJ um, to talk to us about Alethea Global and what they get up to. Thank you. Um, this is so exciting. Um, I'm CJ Tremblay. I'm super happy to be here. Um, I was saying earlier, this is my second virtual conference in the span of like a month, which is, I love that this is happening. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, as mentioned, the founder and managing director of Alethea Global Cooperative. We are a worker co-op uh, and sustainability like training consultancy that works with institutions, associations, governments, and other organizations um, to really increase internationalization, decrease emissions, and to do so all of that work through a climate justice lens. Um, I would say probably and everyone else can ag likely agree with me since you're here in this room is the fact that the mere existence that um, Alethea and IESG uh, exist as organizations uh, in this sector speaks to the drastic changes um, that we're all sort of taking on and the climate realities that we're also all facing. Um, and just before I share my slides, um, I just want to briefly share a little bit about like the origin story of how I find myself like today here with this group of people like co-presenting with, which is just like so humbling. Um, and <clears throat> just, I used to work like five years ago, um, I used to work in the climate, um, sorry, I didn't work at all in the climate uh, action, climate justice space. I was an international education practitioner working in student recruitment, English language testing. And my whole job was pretty much going to all of the conferences on the, like that global circuit. Um, and I think that uh, for a while traveling for work was like a huge part of my personality and identity. Um, I just finished a global MBA, which had four modules in six different countries. And it I, I was working in international education at the time <clears throat> and it never occurred to me to measure the climate impact of my work or my schooling and no one ever brought it up. Um, I remember being completely floored uh, when my sister who's 14 years younger than I am uh, told me she had climate anxiety and sort of starting to put these two pieces of my world together. Um, and the first conf conference after that conversation, I started asking everyone I talked to uh, if they were calculating their emissions, budgeting for offsets, sending fewer people to events, skipping events, measuring their students' um, impact. And I honestly, I didn't even know what to ask, um, what I should ask, but I just kind of like needed to know now. Um, and really nobody I talked to was thinking about it. No one was talking about it, but I couldn't unsee everywhere I looked like those um, systemic gaps and failures by us, sort of the adults in the room to consider the climate impact of the way the sector operated and how there wasn't anyone to help. And there really wasn't anyone to talk to about it. And I was in, this was in November, 2019. And it was like a, a weird, lonely place where sometimes I felt like a little bit like a crazy person. Um, <clears throat> and so there's like real humanity in this work. Um, that we are all um, people at the center of organizations. And um, a month later, a little over a month later, I just like randomly emailed Ilsa because I found the Canny Climate Action Network for International Educators um, just in a conference listing. It was still an informal group and I'm super proud to have become one of its founding members and part of the inaugural uh, VP of the board. And I just wanna like super transparently at the time, knew nothing about climate science. Um, but the pandemic happened and we were all weirdly um, happy to not be talking about uh, 
the pandemic and we were very happy to be talking about climate change, which was a weird time to be. Um, but that work helped me throw myself into it um, and learning as much as I could. So uh, just to make sure we didn't go back to the way it's always been done and the sort of injustices that were sort of fundamentally built into that. Um, and I just couldn't be more like grateful to be here today in what is really like a full circle moment with a sort of Alethea being such a so connected to um canny so I did want to just very like recognize that and sort of share that it's exciting um for us and for me to be here um and to sort of talk about that so uh I just want to start by saying recognizing that this work that I'm joining virtually from the traditional ancestral and stolen territories of the Coast Salish people, which is the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil waututh nations. And this is a truth that anchors our work in every day. Um, it, we know it to be true that the people who are most harmed by the climate crisis are currently not um, really contributing it to the most. So we're seeing sort of this disconnect and a huge part of our work is not just working with clients, but it's also advocacy. And so with that, a little bit about us is that our name is quite literally translates from the Greek goddess Aletheia, which means sort of the state of not being hidden, the state of being evident. And we do our work as a worker co-op, um, which means instead of being sort of beholden to profit-driven shareholders, we really are beholden to ourselves, our mission and our community. And our community is the international education sector. So what that looks like in terms of how we support that is when we talk about measurement, like we're all dealing with goals and targets. Um, and so just to set some context for the conversation, we all know we need to reduce emissions. Um, the author of the Kenny Glasgow paper is in the room, shout out to Adrian. But this was referenced in that and talks about the Race to Zero campaign being sort of really serving to rally leadership around um, and support from industry, businesses, and institutions from around the world, including international education. Um, and as important as the work that we do is, we're not absolved from sort of solving these problems. Um, and so, you know, th these goals are important. Knowing what our goals are, um, are we're looking at 50% reduction of emissions in each of the decades leading to 2050. I was at a, a conference and someone reminded me that that is, at the time, it was 72 months away. And now we're like, 70 months away so we are we are we're motoring um and so with that context i just want to say that we're not saying stop everything now this really just talks about um really making sure that we're starting to plan as soon as possible so that by 2030 we're looking at emissions that are 50 percent of where we were at the start of the decade which really is like the 2019 that last normal year before the pandemic and planning for emissions reductions is one of the ways that we sort of support the sector. And the way that we maximize and optimize our impact is we wanna make sure we're making those reductions with equity-centered climate action in mind. So that's the intersection of our work as well as climate action and sustainability, as well as the justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, all that like human rights work we've really been focused on um, that is inherently connected um, so with that context in mind, I kind of just want to share like our truth, how we've oper operationalized these goals and how our own work really models the way that we work with our clients and partners and really use ourselves as an example and sort of say, like, we understand what our, our clients and partners are going through, um, having done some of this work. Um, our areas of focus internally um, in order to maximize our impact, which means reducing emissions and embedding climate justice, um, is sort of all done within our organization, but what can we do sort of within our own operation in our organization? And then what do we do within sort of the greater um, system of international education? I'm not going to talk about those like shaded ones. I just want to focus on sort of those five because I think they're connected to some of um, the work that we're all doing and sort of processing now. First of all, foundationally, we've anchored our internal benchmarking to the framework of the Kenny Accord right, talking about increasing our commitments over time. And we're super proud that we've been able to help so many of our like clients and partners navigate the process of becoming signatories. In the morning session, people were like, 
sometimes it's really easy and sometimes it's really terrible. And I've shared that on even worse, sometimes a board wants a full report with a big plan. Um, and that can be sort of an overwhelming beast, but this is a model and a framework that was built for practitioners by practitioners. Um, and we sort of fundamentally believe uh, in supporting that and also like being willing to lead by example. Our most important commitments are listed here. And in my opinion, they're just table stakes, right? Because they are explicitly transforming how we work and focus on reducing emissions. Um, and these can be applied to institutions and sort of organizations and those other types of associations and organizations we work with. But for us, accounting for emissions and not limiting just to scope one and two, but looking at all those emissions, as well as ensuring that we're not leaning on offsets as a substitution, but rather they're our last line of defense. Um, number 30, obviously, is a big one. Um, but I just want to flag here that um, the word possible and not you know, the word is not I want to or when I will like it or when I can do it without missing out. These are like important truths of our uh, sector. And when I talked about earlier, sort of like my personality felt like it was traveling for work and what that means. Um, and really just facing that. And then action 39 leads us to our next area of focus and really something we have worked with with our clients and partners as well. But when we first started, Alethea was primarily based out of Vancouver because that's where me and my colleagues <laughs> live. Um, but we've expanded and built our team based on supporting our partners and clients, like international clients, while also being able to event, attend events with the fewest emissions possible. So we added really like passionate and skilled team members in Europe, as well as team members who have secondary locations due to their student status or family commitments in other regions, which has allowed us to do sort of the following. And right, this is a whole session on measurement um, and decarbonizing really is key. So our work is in reducing emissions. So we were prepared to sort of pull back the curtain on the work that we do. Um, and in 2019, obviously, as I mentioned, I was mostly sad and by myself uh, and there was no Aletheia yet. <laughs> um, but myself and who are now our founding members all worked in this sector for service providers. And we did, you know, that business the way it's always been done. So we established our emissions baselines using our travel emissions at different organizations, but in similar roles. And then since starting Alethea mid-pandemic in 2021, we took a completely different approach to how we do our work, right? Um, we were able to decrease our emissions more than 50 tons by around 94%, which I can appreciate is like overachieving by like a lot and probably unrealistic because we're continuing to grow. But and, you know, way more than that, like 50% target. So like extreme decarbonization is great, um, but not always realistic for everyone. And sort of where we recognize that. But what's also interesting is we were able to reduce the emissions intensity of attending, attending events, meaning the emissions that we're using to attend events has been reduced from an average of more than like four tons to 0 0.5 tons per event. Um, and so this is something we talk about on our blog. I encourage you to check that out because it's not been easy, but I also like really don't think we're special here. Um, we've had to ask ourselves some hard questions about how we do our work. We also ask these questions of our clients and partners, and I think you can ask them of yourselves and we really like share transparently um, what's there. So I hope that sheds a little bit more light, but the long and short of it is we achieve this by making some hard choices. Um, we don't participate at events where they don't align with our values. We make choices based on geography first. If there's a local opportunity, we can leverage our international team. And we're also just working differently than before, during, after, between events, really just spending time learning like the multitude of different like virtual event platforms. Um, and so this is like our own work. This is the approach we take for our clients on all the different dimensions of their operations. Um, whether they're conference providers um, who measure like travel or study abroad offices looking to understand the impact of their program. We're really looking at some important questions and getting to like innovating and planning for those reductions for like total emissions, emissions and intensity and like other KPIs and then, you know, rinse, learn, repeat. Um, and so I'm happy to share this photo, which I was uh, my abnormally like, very large presence in a room full of normal sized humans um, at the conference, um, the education forum on education abroad's conference in Boston last week. 
And this was really made possible because individuals made a choice, right? This was entirely possible because someone in charge made, said that I could present virtually by a video recording at an in-person conference. And we were able to save just shy of two tons. And this is the stuff we need more of in the sector. We don't wanna shift the burden onto individuals or the students. Um, there's individual, there's intergenerational, all very different dimensions of justice on shifting the burden onto individuals. So a huge part of our work in terms of maximizing the impact at the system level is asking you like, are you to think about what is your context in, and that's sort of questions we ask of our clients is what are your, what is your position to advocate for whether it's more virtual engagement, more resources to prioritize climate justice training or planning. And like, what are those power levers look like for people? And for us, you know, and everyone really, time is the one resource that is finite. Um, and so where you're spending your time and energy uh, matters. And are you using whatever power and levers that you have to advance climate justice and decarbonize your work and our sector? And for us, we started choosing to work with clients and partners who bring on system change with their influence um, and deciding where to navigate like that bureaucracy and where to work like more directly. Um, but I do think that we can do both things, right? Focusing on the bigger picture while we do our day-to-day -day work of keeping our emissions low and reducing those of like our clients and partners. Um, and we really do take that holistic approach to looking at the different systems people are a part of um, and the dynamics between them and how we can maximize emissions reduction impact while maintaining that commitment to internationalization because everybody at Aletheia are international practitioners first. Um, so again, turning the tables back on ourselves, um, where we have some power is as sponsors. So we pushed the forum for education abroad to let us sponsor specifically the virtual conference, cause that's what aligned with our values. Naturally, we are supporting Canny and we also push our clients to do the same. Um, and I think it's exciting, um, as much as it is scary, both things can be true at once, um, about how in our work we can advance this advanced innovations that can be implemented. And every person's context is different, right? We are super keen to be able to walk that journey alongside our clients and partners around the sector, knowing that everybody is at a different place. <clears throat> and I said this earlier, um, I understand that we're in a time where um, resources are sort of strained. So we really follow through on only supporting events that are committed to leading. Uh, this change, who provide virtual events, who focus on climate action, and really who meet us where we are on boundaries for emission strategy. And I think that there's something to be said for working with our clients on identifying and thinking differently on what that looks like and that individualized approach, because so many different people are in different places and in different institutional contexts. Um, so we're super proud, obviously, um, to support Climate Action Week and other initiatives at a system level. Um, and I understand that system change can be harder to measure, but the mental like ballpark math for the potential impact of that large scale adaptation and innovation is really sort of the exciting part. Um, I think that keeps us all doing this, <laughs> this work um, and keeps us um, doing it at all hours of the day. Um, so I mentioned earlier, you know, Debs is here, it's like almost midnight. Um, so we really do the work of um, the, like the commitment level of the people in this room. Like we're, I know I'm sort of preaching to the choir, but just reminding people just that for me, this is like a full circle moment because Alethea was born out of advocacy work where a few of us left our like traditional jobs in the sector to help people along that climate journey and to sort of lead by example and sort of be loud about it. And so we never really lost those advocacy roots. Um, so I would say that like our final um, parting notes would be, um, and I'm sort of happy to stop sharing, but um, you know, not everybody is able to can or start measuring their impact right away, but you're certainly able to make those loud commitments of measuring it in short order today um, and make loud commitments to take action on those um, emissions, on reducing those emissions. So I think that it's great and wonderful that we're all here. Like the next steps really are like more measuring and then like ultimately that cycle of reducing 
learning, we're doing more, learning more, um, and sort of the people in this room are the people best poised to do that. Fantastic. Thanks so much, DJ. As I said earlier, it's always so um, invigorating, reinvigorating to hear you talk and to hear about your journey um, to where you are now with um, Climate Action and Alethea. So thanks so much. Emily, you have your hand up. Do you have a question? I do. Yes, I've got a question for, for CJ. It's just, um, it's so nice watching you know, other people that work in the sector and just looking at, you know, the types of organisations you're working with and, and, and how you do it. Um, as I mentioned, like the, the barometer, it, it kind of organically gives institutions um, their commitments that they, they've already met for the Canny Accord because they can see all their policies and practices in one. So we almost can hand over to them and say, oh, you can become a signatory and we talk them through that. But actually getting them to make that decision of, and then finding the right person in the organisation um, can be the tricky part. So it was so nice hearing about your journey, but how do you actually bring others into that journey? So when you're actually talking them through, you know, some of those recommendations, is it like, do you find it's about finding the right person in the organization or getting a number of people in the room? You know, how can you actually get them over the line? Because as much as we can give them, yeah, I guess those those commitments that they've met, we've still found that it's there's sometimes pushback around actually signing up to the Canny Accord just because it, it not, might get... To, to a level where the decision making takes you know forever or is just never made. Yeah, so that's a great but I'm like yes, we are all in the same room sharing the same struggle. It is real. Um and I would say for our work when I talk about like very early on that like navigating the bureaucracy like there are places where it's just like not worth the effort. Um because and it's sometimes outside of the control of the people you're talking to but so what we found is working with associations and you'll note that like the people we've primarily been working in Canada for now um the primarily that work has been with associations um because they are large in influence and small in bureaucracy which is like a great um sweet spot to get momentum so that's really where we've um, started. And then I've also, as we've expanded internationally, I would say I am often reminded of like cultural differences. So this may not be true everywhere else, but in uh, Canada, at least very is, which is very conservative um, in terms of, you know, we don't value innovation necessarily and being first. We're kind of like, we just don't want to be last. Um, and anyone who's watching this from Canada knows it's true. Um, I would just say that sometimes an outside person, that voice is more influential than the person inside, which I'm like, I don't know, you know, your institution better. Well, why? But it, that is, that has been, um, having that external recommendation, um, brought to a decision-making body and also like saying, you don't have to have your whole institution sign this. It can be let out of the international office and actually like Auckland is such a good example of that that we point people to like the what is it think devs it was like the weight the tail wagging the dog mm -hmm. um where it was like sometimes like it can be led through that and so we've we've had so it's like a mix of two things like sometimes it's just like not I can't help the big bureaucracy mm -hmm. but if we can get a smaller slice of that bureaucracy great but then also the flip side is like maximizing our time with the impact um, in terms of the associations. No, thank you. I went from working for an association for 10 years to working in a university. And then that was around the time that Elsa and Will reached out. And I was like, yes, anything but this bureaucracy. I can't get any changes made in this institution. <laughs> get me out of here. Um, that, yeah. that makes sense. Thank you. Thanks, both. Um, I think in, in hearing you both talk, you know, some of this, um, in, in what we're doing in the area that we're working in, in is, you know, starting the conversation and actually using something as a catalyst to, uh, or a framework to assess, review, and just look at where you are to begin with before you can then implement, or before you can measure the change that you're trying to implement. And so I think it's really useful to 
um, have these kind of open, honest discussions around, yeah, it can be tough, but actually it's, it is possible. And we can see it possible through these organizations, through these initiatives and through the work that, you know, a number of us in this room are doing. So um, thank you for that. I just want to um, move on and briefly introduce the Kanye Accord. We've spoken about it, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a little bit. And for anyone in the room who is not aware of what the Kanye Accord is, here is your whistle stop tour in the last 10 minutes. Um, it is a public commitment and a menu of practical actions designed to guide the international education sector's response to the climate crisis. And so this was brought about um, in late 2021, when um, Canny brought a, lead, a group of leaders across the sector from these associations, from these organizations and institutions uh, together to really look at and challenge them with the climate crisis and the climate emergency. Um, from that, the Canny, the Canny Accord and the Glasgow paper um, was born. Um, the Canny Accord uh, provides a framework for um, com committing to climate action in your organisation. Um, a quick overview of this, there are eight articles. Um, articles one to three provide the, the context and set the scene alongside the Glasgow paper. Um, you know, all signatories are required to agree and commit to the first three principles, which are taking immediate action, um, the need to collaborate, innovate and educate, um, and to develop climate solutions that advance social justice. Um, the, uh, the articles four to eight, as you can see, span a range of kind of topics and themes. Um, the wonderful thing about the Canny Accord is that these are presented in a, a kind of progressive format of categories um, from basic to better to best. So there's that real opportunity to um, to start out somewhere, but then also to see the progression and to see the reach and to aim to get that best practice in in those areas. So, for example, within leadership and influencing, um, you know, what can what can you as your organisation achieve with what you are doing within your sphere of influence? Um, emissions and accounting, emissions accounting and reduction. Can you commit to just start counting? Can you just start looking at your emissions? And then can you look at, okay, what do we do with that? What are the targets we want to set? How do we want to decrease these emissions? Um, and I think CJ, you know, you said, and it's it's a great point, you know, we can't stop doing everything now, but we need to start planning for the future because, and, and we need to know where we're starting from in order to see that impact of, of, of that change and that activity. Um, so the Canny Accord has 70 of these actions across all of the eight articles. Um, and to become a signatory, you're required to commit to five out of these across three of the, the bottom categories there, as well as the, the, the first three um, articles. I've just gone on this journey with my organisation, Universe S21, um, and we are a global network of 29 universities. Um, and we recently have um, published a new 21 commitment to sustainability. And that outlines the principles that we as a network want to take. Um, for us, the next the, the next logical step was to look to the Kenny Accord, which provides a framework for how we actually action and implement those articles that we're currently undergoing a bit of a mapping process. And we only signed in February, just to let you know. So we're we're very early on in our journey here. And I know there's a number of people in the room who may be more advanced in their their, their Kenny Accord journey. But um, just to reiterate that point, for, for us, it was a really good starting point just to raise the question and to question what we're doing in all of these kind of areas and, and really take a, a hard look at it and then look at actually what we're currently doing, which is really exciting to see how much is already going on, but then also to see, OK, now where do we want to stretch to? Where do we want to be and how do we want to get there? So. Um, for the Canny Accord, in order to sign it, there is a form on the Canny website. Um, you receive a, a, a draft of the commitments you go in and select which ones um, you want to commit to. And then you receive a toolkit to help share and promote your commitment to this. Because we know we can't do this alone and we need to do this in partnership. And there is a wonderful community of people um, involved in Canny um, and involved in climate action who are all champions of this and who are all here to you know, support each other and work together in this. 
what I'd really recommend and what we did was, um, you know, just really look through all of those actions and take, take each one step by step and, and map that onto your current operations, map that onto your current strategies, and then look at what, what you want to do next. So with U21, we've got a lovely little spreadsheet that says, OK, here's all our commitments. Here's what we currently do, uh, uh, tracking those commitments. And here's where we want to be in 12 months time. Um, and so we're really hoping that that's going to keep us um, keep us moving and, and keep us going. The each, each signatory receives their own um, listing in the signatory directory on the CANI website. And so this is a really important way for us all to maintain accountability to your commitments. You can go in, you can take a look at, you know, who signed up to what, and, and you can go and see um, what that looks like. Each uh, signatory has their own landing page, in effect, that outlines those commitments in in um, black and white or green, green and black, I guess. Um, <laughs> so feel free to go and have a look around there. The toolkit you receive, um, again, like I said, enables you to um, just really promote what you are doing. Another example from U21, some of the, uh, the Canny Accord commitments, um, there is one around inserting climate literacy training modules into programming for all globally mobile students. And there's another one that's leveraging signatories influence to insert climate literacy modules into undergraduate orientation packs. Now for U21, we are currently undergoing a mammoth task of mapping all of the modules that are linked to sustainability and climate with all of our 29 institutions that are available online and in person at those institutions. And what we're looking to do is, is build that map and look at where the, the synergies are and then look to really um, uh, focus in on some of those themes and, and, and look at how we might attach some targets or broaden that reach. Um, as I said, we're still very early on in our journey here um, and we are um, excited to see where, where it really goes. So I just want to pause and open up for any any comments um, if anyone has any questions um, before we begin to wrap up this session. Any questions? I think I'd like to take a second just to express like a huge amount of gratitude for all of the work that's gone into everything that has, um, you know, to see um, structure and support around measuring and reducing and then tightening those screws and measuring and reducing. It's just, it's really inspiring. And um, yeah, so many voices and so much effort and action from many, many different people went into the Candy Accord and looking at this, the, um, the screen of the, the branding and how all of the signatories appear in the website like that took so much work <laughs> from from CJ and CJ's team and yeah it's just really amazing that this is such a, um, a great community and so much volunteer work that went into it um, and it's yeah just fills me with gratitude that there's this much action and volunteer labor that goes into it so thank you for everything that you're doing. Thanks, Adrian. And like it's been mentioned in the comments, you know, you were so instrumental in getting us to the starting point of this, you know, and without you, we couldn't have uh, taken this and, and got to where we are. So thanks back to you as well. Um, I know um, I know what that journey was <laughs> for you. So that's brilliant. Um, and as you mentioned, we are a volunteer run organisation. Um, and if you would like to support the ongoing work of Canny, um, we welcome uh, your, your, your joining at Canny, um, but also if you would like to kind of financially contribute so we can um, expand what we're doing, build on what we are doing, support more organisations in signing the Canny Accord, then please do um, check out uh, canny.org forward slash donate. Um, and just finally to wrap up with one minute to go, um, this is day two, believe it or not, uh, depending on where you are in the world, of Climate Action Week. Um, we have a few more sessions tomorrow. Um, we have some COP28 reflections and, and preparations on COP29. Canny was um, really privileged to have two, two members attend COP28 this year. Um, we had a student-led session earlier, and the second one of those is, is also taking place today, tomorrow, uh, depending on your time zone. And then we have the regional chapter meetings. Um, and this is a really good opportunity to connect in with a local group of canny, cannyites 
Kami Bods, who um, will really support you in building your, your network. Um, and it's a great opportunity just to talk to people, to, no matter where you are in your climate action journey, if you're feeling a little confused and you're not quite sure where to start, you know, turn up to one of these, um, express your, how you're feeling. And I'm sure there will be plenty of people to, um, to share that load and to work together to do some wonderful things. So on that note, thanks to CJ and to Emily for your contributions today. Thanks to everyone else who has joined us and participated. The recording for this week will be up on the Canny YouTube channel towards the end of the week. So if you've missed any, please go back and, and re-watch them um, or share those links with colleagues if you're wanting them to find out more. Thanks a lot. Take care. Have a wonderful day, evening, afternoon, night. Thanks, Debs. Bye, everyone. Bye.